Wandering along Marsham Street en route to Take Britain, I stopped across Page Street, looked right and thought, goodness, what's that? Well, that was the Grosvenor Estate. The Grosvenor Estate was built on land affected by the 1928 Thames Flood. Riverbanks began overflowing in the early hours of Saturday, January the 7th, 1928, resulting in 14 deaths. Two huge breaches of the masonry bank walls were made between Lambeth Bridge and Vauxhall Bridge, and Westminster suffered the river's wrath most with a death count of 10, and widespread property loss and destruction. Included in the destruction were paintings housed in Tate Britain's basement, which was known as Tate Gallery at that point. All the smaller turners along with numerous other pictures were stored unframed in the basement, and it was feared many of the turners had been ruined. Water immersion would only enhance Turner's in Tarquin's view. He finds Turner's work tedious and repetitive. It's a view difficult to fault. Westminster Council condemned the structures on the Grosvenor Estate site and demolished them after the flood. Hugh Grosvenor, who owned the land, donated it to the city on a 999 year lease for construction of accommodation for the working class, on the proviso that Edwin Lutyens would be the architect. At the time, Lutyens was working as the consulting architect at nearby Grosvenor House. Keep in mind the term, working class, as we shall be returning to it later in this video. The land Grosvenor leased to Westminster Council was worth £200,000. He also provided £113,000 for the flat's construction to his trustees. This large S was not a solely altruistic decision. The 1894 Finance Act introduced estate duty, which levied inheritance tax on the receiver, causing large estates to be broken up for the first time. Grosvenor's liability after his grandfather's death in 1899 was calculated at over £600,000, necessitating large sales of estate property to meet this fee. The Settled Land Act of 1925 allowed life tenants of settled land such as Hugh Grosvenor to grant 999 year leases while retaining the freehold as an alternative to outright sales, and this alternative was employed on the Grosvenor Estate land. Grosvenor Estate comprises seven blocks of five and six storeys which face Page Street and Vincent Street. Constructed around paved, airy, communal courtyards in large U-shapes, the southern ends remain empty of flats, but side single-storey pavilions acting as gatehouses. A high gallery access runs around the inner courtyard. The typical building plan of each block has kitchen, baths and some bedrooms facing the open gallery around the courtyard, with living spaces and most bedrooms facing the landscape space between the blocks. Originally, each dwelling possessed a toilet room and kitchen, but no bath. The 1960s saw almost all kitchens divided to create separate bathrooms. Coal stoves provided heating, with the coal being stored in a bin next to the entry. Gas provided heat in the smaller rooms and fuel for cooking. Layout of the blocks is a 3-2-2 grid. North lie a Baddy House, Edric House and Bennett House, all three being roughly similar in size and construction. Abadi and Edric houses host 84 flats, and Bennett House holds 72. Tothill House and Rogers House, the two biggest blocks, occupy the middle grid, each containing 141 flats. There were more flats, but a section of each house's inner wing was demolished in 1970 to accommodate a garden and playground. South sit the much smaller Princess Mary House and Duke's House, both possessing 35 flats apiece. Estate construction began in 1928, and when work was completed in 1936, the total number of flats reached nearly 600. One phase of the estate was officially opened on Wednesday the 9th of July 1930, in a ceremony where 70 flats of one, two, three and four rooms, ranging in price from 5 shillings, 25 new pence, to 16 shillings, 80 new pence per week, were inspected by dignitaries, or masons as they're better known. As comparison, a one bedroom flat in Tothill House was offered for rent at 37,500 new pence per week, or £375, in July 2015. The final phase official opening ceremony was held in June 1936. 
guest of honour was Lucy Baldwin, wife of then Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin, and she told fellow guest Edwin Lutyens what she thought women wanted in future blocks of flats. Being a woman, I think most of us are interested in housing, especially those who, like myself, are not above calling themselves a housewife. What we really want in our homes are plenty of fresh air, a good kitchen and lots of hot water, and beyond that a larder. We also want a sink where we can wash things, no matter if you have a communal laundry, and furthermore, we do want somewhere where we can dry clothes. I'm rather a bold woman, I suppose it's being wife of a Prime Minister, and having the leading and best architect of the country on the platform rather delivers him into my hands. I'm going to tell him what I want in the next block of flats he builds. That is, a flat roof where toddlers can play and where mothers can take their sewing. And if possible, I would like a nursery school on that roof. Tothill House was granted Grade 2 listed status in February 1970. Here's the text from that listing, detailing Tothill House's architectural stylings. Grey brick and white rendered checkerboard external elevations with grey brick and rendered access galleries to courtyard elevations, spare stone dressings, concealed roofs. Stripped Georgian style with decorative details confined to entrance bay. This block has a symmetrical front to Page Street and long courtyard flank ranges, that to west extending through to Vincent Street QV, enclosing deep rectangular courtyard, six storeys to Page Street and to returns with five storeys to extension through to Vincent Street. Page Street front has central broad recess, blind apart from central stair lights, flanked by shallow wings, each four windows wide, but leaving one blind bay as a rendered panel in checkerboard, central channelled pier entrance to stairs, with archivolt arch under open pediment and stepped stone parapet above, set in built-out ashlar screen wall, four carved stone escutcheon panels above, flush framed glazing bar sashes in checkerboard, parapet copings finish off the facades, the flank ranges and four window end to Vincent Street are similar. An imaginative Lucian's treatment of a standard LCC type of housing block. And a description of Tothill House's Pavilion Gatehouse, which was granted Grade 2 listed status in December 1987. Portland stone and grey brick slate roof, neo-Georgian single-storey pavilion, tripartite front with central glazing bar sash window and fixed side lights, glazed and panelled doors in stone architraves and similar sash windows to returns, articulated by deeply channelled piers and coin piers, cornice and parapet below eaves of pyramidal roof with crowning finial, a butting ashlar, ball finialed gate piers, the corresponding pier to left abutting the end of the long courtyard and range of Tothill House. We now return to the term working class. Grosvenor Estate bobbed along providing affordable housing for working class people, as Hugh Grosvenor has stipulated, until the late 1980s, when enter head of Westminster City Council Shirley Porter and BSC. BSC, or Building Stronger Communities, was a secret policy described by critics as Homes for Votes. The Tories narrowly won Westminster Council in 1986, but feared losing the 1990 elections and needed more Tory voters in their borough. BSC focused on eight marginal wards, and when council properties became vacant, they were designated for commercial sale, resulting in an influx of homeowners more likely to vote Tory. Grosvenor Estate was situated in one of these marginal wards, and the flats were selected for designated sales when they became empty. This meant anyone working in the City of Westminster could purchase council properties, or their leaseholds, at 30% of their true market value. But there was no resale limit imposed, enabling the council housing stock to be raked by speculators and sold at huge profit a few years later. Gerald Grosvenor, Hugh's great-grandson, maintained the flats should fulfil their original purpose and refused to remove the working class clause from the lease. Gerald did, however, offer the compromise that 10% of the flats could be sold, 
provided the remaining 90% continue to serve as low rent accommodation. This disagreement between Gerald and Westminster Council resulted in a court case. Westminster Council claimed the clause should be set aside, as the term working classes had no meaning in contemporary society. Hmm, a Tory council using society in their argument. Didn't Tory scum Thatcher say to Women's Own magazine on October the 31st, 1987? There's no such thing as society! Yes, she did. Judge Harmon ruled in Gerald's favour, saying, The clause was not valid today as when it was made and there was no evidence that the term working class was now obsolete. Adding, Westminster Council were under continuing obligation to house the working class in Pimlico and could not sell the flats to anyone other than sitting tenants. Four years later, after Gerald's court case, in 1994 Westminster Council leader Shirley Porter was found guilty of willful misconduct and gerrymandering and ordered to pay surcharges of £31.6 million to Westminster Council. This later rose to £42 million with interest and legal fees. Gerrymandering is manipulating the boundaries of an electoral constituency to favour a political party.